Thank you. I will be concise, trying not to use additional minutes, referring you to the papers which you have, my two papers. Also, I will run out of the uh, outline, an expanded outline of what I'm going to say has been distributed to save time and because of the sensitivity of the subject, so I'm careful about the wording. I'm focusing on one particular issue. Having spoken about Jewish people leadership in another panel, I focus here on Israeli political leadership. This doesn't mean that spiritual leadership is not more important, but I don't feel qualified to say anything about it. You can do that. No, it's a serious, Professor. It's working on something. Now, justification. The quality of 100, 200, 300 top politicians in Israel is very critical for the future of Israel, for relations between Israel and the Jewish people, and because of the consequences, if Israel declines or fails, they are also carrying much responsibility for the future of the Jewish people as a whole. So for focusing on Israeli political high-level leadership is justified in terms of their importance. It is also justified because of the many, uh, well, shall I say, flows. Now, before I give a list, a total full list of the flows, this is a generalization. There are exceptions, but not too many. Also, the flows are not necessarily a result of their own doing. <laughs> Lack of state tradition, cultures, political constraints, mass media impacts, dependence on money to be elected, there are many factors that provide a part explanation, but not a full justification for the flows of Israeli political leadership. So those flows are critical. Now, similar flows are widespread in modern leadership all over the world. Because in short, the traditions of leadership don't fit the innovative features of the new area of the 21st century. But if other countries can carry mediocre leaders without too high costs. This is not true for Israel, because 60 years of heroic success don't assure the future. What will happen is that if for the next 60 years depends a lot on the Jewish people in Israel, but it depends a lot within that lot on the quality of leadership. In other words, the quality of leadership is not a matter of cosmetics, it's not a matter of convenience, it is an existential necessity. Now, after having put in the caveats, and I'm not telling his personal faults, but is an institution of leadership, political leadership in Israel, let me go through seven, eight main flows. Then I will provide a number of improvement recommendations, and then I'll stop. One, lack of deep understanding of what it means to be a Jewish state and the state of the Jewish people. Very well, what I'm saying is fact supported, and in part fact proven. Most Israeli senior politicians don't understand what's happening in the Jewish people outside Israel, and I'm not sure if they understand what's happening on a deep level in Israel too. Second, imbalance between values and ideologies on one hand, and the realistic view of historic dynamics. Please, statecraft, external and internal, is some type of synthesis or compromise between your hopes, your wishes, your values, and the stubborn facts of reality. In Israel, leaders tend to oscillate, the public too, to oscillate between too much realism and too much dreamism. Herzl's slogan, if, if you believe it, it will not be a dream, has to be supplemented, and if you, build, and if you dream, it will still remain a dream. Not everything that one wants is possible. Three, inadequate long-term thinking, instead undue fixation, on what Walter Benjamin called now time. For absence of a strategic mind, with undue concern, with success instead. You know I've been a member of the Military Committee, our findings are uh, well published in clear language, that during the war, the top leadership didn't show strategic thinking. Not only they, but this is a living. Five, much tunnel vision without adequate multi-dimensional thinking and systems comprehension. Let's say that we return to the justice illustration, I have a hundred of them, to the Second Lebanon War, uh, beyond the Willowgrad Committee, we just hinted it, 
the implications of what happens in Lebanon and the future tactics of the Hamas have not been a main concern, I think. Because we really taught the Hamas to use, to use cheap missile attacks as a strategic weapon. Six, too much concern with taking power with other required readiness to take personal risks in order to advance necessary but controversial policies. In other words, what is called in the better literature, disinterestedness. No, one cannot expect complete disinterestedness. But I would say some exceptions. Too few top leaders resigned because you couldn't in good conscience follow the policies which were dictated to them in circumstances. Seven, focusing on image marketing and spins instead of educating and enlightening the public. In Israel, in the Jewish people as a whole, leaders have to an important educational function, which nearly all of them, again, everything is exceptions, don't fulfill. Uh, then I will add one more. Inadequate com empathy with the needy and prefer the company of the rich and powerful. Widespread in other countries, but not a lot of Now, what should we do? Not hard, easy to deal with it, because Comparatively speaking, similar flows are widespread. It's endemic to certain features of uh, politics in the modern area. Still, some things can be done. A, we have to consider changing the political and electoral system, maybe in a quasi-presidential direction, and, as has been advocated by some others, abolishing the primaries as practiced now, which introduce uh, a strong dependence on capital by politicians. Two, enforcing a demanding code of ethics for politicians, including demanding uh, exposing themselves to the public, health records, and so on. A senior politician has no right to privacy as a private citizen. The public is entitled to know. Those who don't like to expose themselves, there are many candidates for prime ministership and for other ministerial positions. No lack of them. Special demands have to be made on politicians impairing some of the rights of the citizen, which is justified. No one forces them to become a politician. <laughs> Three, strict imposition of responsibility on politicians who fail in their main tasks. Raises questions of the behavior of the government as such after the first interim Vinograd report. Four, providing politicians with convenient and attractive learning, thinking, and contemplative opportunities, such as Aspen type retreats, intense workshops, and maybe some type of sabbatical. He can alone support that, such a you law, know, work to see what it didn't go through. Five, setting up an institute for Jewish people and Israeli leadership development with a variety of programs with special attention to young leadership aspirants. Let's say we can take as a prototype the National Security Council, uh, National Security, the National Security Staff College, reduce it to one month or two months for a broad a French example for a broader audience. Last but not least, motivating outstanding university graduates to enter politics and facilitates the doing so. Personal confession, up to about 10 years ago when my uh, best students came to me and asked me what should they do, I didn't encourage them to go to politics. <coughs> so get the point. Politics, uh, I myself had opportunities to go to politics. I didn't do it. I'm not, I think I did right, but I don't know. Because in politics requires the ability to sit for hours, listen to stupidity, and compliment the speakers. <laughs> Absolute necessity. Unless you have a parachute and you go in from a general ship and something like this. Even there, if you don't learn it, you're kicked out. This is, one has to pay a price. And I told the students, don't pay the price. You don't have enough time to read. Now I say, the best to politics. Thank you.